Welcome everyone to the 2023 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference, brought to you in partnership with Animal Evac New Zealand and our platinum sponsor, Four Paws International. Before we begin, we have a few basic housekeeping items. We want to bring your attention to an update to our conference schedule. There was an error with the Australian Times for the New York sessions F and H on the original schedule. Please visit our website at www.gadmc.org to view the updated and corrected schedule. The Zoom chat feature has been disabled, but we encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A box. This year we have enabled multilingual closed captioning so if you would like to hear the presentation in another language, please click the closed caption icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We encourage you to use the hashtag GADMCONF on social media to help us spread word about the conference. A short evaluation will be made available as you exit the presentation. Your feedback is valuable to us and will help to shape the next GABMAC conference. Finally, a reminder that the video recording of this and all other presentations will be available later this year after it has been properly edited. It is our privilege to welcome Altamush Saeed, who is an animal rights lawyer and social activist from Pakistan. He is the director of the Charity Doings Foundation and joins us today to present Pakistan, a case study on disasters and the legal way forward. Ultimus. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to actually speak about this topic and represent Pakistan. I'm extremely grateful to GADMAC and uh, I hope this presentation helps um, in basically providing a case study as to the natural disaster work that I did last year through my nonprofit. Uh, we will have a very um, short agenda. Uh, first of all, really an acknowledgement about animal cruelty. Uh, that's how I always start all of my presentations. Uh, my a, a small primer about Charity Doings Foundation, what it does and how natural disasters are actually part of our, our, our mainstream uh, mission. And then I actually want to break down into the Natural Disaster Management Act itself, which is the, the main uh, federal law in our country that regulates uh, natural disaster responses. And uh, then I will slightly mention the Sendai framework as well, because that's uh, a Pakistan's party to it. And lastly, is, is more about the case study and the flood work that I do and a few numbers and, and some uh, very important lessons. Uh, that I learned through through my non uh, disaster relief work uh, last year and this year as well. So uh, this is actually something I always do. So I'll just recite this: that we, as a member of human race, acknowledge the harm and cruelty that we impose upon animals or evil citizens of land and earth that have no say. And uh, under that same ideology, what we work at Charity Doing Foundation is is a is in as the nexus of human animal and environmental welfare work and that's kind of our mission statement and uh, we do projects all over the country and recently uh pakistan unfortunately had a major disaster last year uh about which i'll talk uh briefly in detail uh so we actually went in the flood zones to rescue animals uh alongside human beings there is a project that's uh that's deeply in the natural disaster work is that drought actually, unfortunately, is, is a major occurrence that happens in Pakistan every year. Unfortunately, Pakistan um, Natural Disaster Management Authority doesn't have a plan to um, regulate that, which I will highlight um, shortly. So um, before jumping in, I actually want to explain the legal system in Pakistan, and that's um, one lesson that I wanted to share is uh, before we do any natural disaster work, we need to do uh, a brief survey, and it's it, it has a lot of things. Firstly, it has to be the legal system, and Pakistan has a common law system where which is very similar to um, 
across the world, the U.S. system and all those. But the unique feature of the Pakistan ecosystem is we have an Islamic system as well. And uh, Islamic ideology is part of the things, and that actually plays a major part in this work. So I just wanted to highlight that and uh, and and to just explain uh, the main act under which most of the disaster management work happens is under the National Disaster Management Act, which was formulated in 10 after a major disaster that happened in Pakistan in 2005. And the structure is fairly simple. Uh, it's hierarchical, where there's a National Disaster Management Commission on the top that has uh, people, including the minister and other ministries. And alongside that, uh, under the national, national level, we below that level, we have the Provincial Disaster Management Authority. Uh, under that is also the commission, which involves leadership in, in different states. Uh, so in, in the in the different provinces in, in our country. And below that, we have district level management authorities as well, because um, we have a local government system in, in past as well. So we, it, for implementation purposes and real disaster management system at a district level is uh, very much beneficial and very useful in, in implementation. Uh, to basically fully describe the National Disaster Management Act itself, I wanted to uh, highlight that within this law, uh, disasters have a specific definition where they talk about where a disaster, disaster is a disaster or calamity in infected area arising from uh, nat natural or man-made causes or by accident of fire or bomb blast, which result in a substantial loss of human suffering or damage, uh, both movable and wool. And this basically means natural disasters are actually part of a, a, a disaster definition and uh, that basically means and is, is that uh, prevention frameworks are something that are crucial to the system. Altamesh, we lost you there for just a second. If you'd like to share your screen again. Okay, one second, sorry. No, that's fine. And your audio has been just a little uh, choppy. If you want to perhaps turn off your camera so you're just sharing your screen, that sometimes helps with the connection. Okay. Um, is this better? Oh, it sounds better. Okay, so under our National Disaster Management Act, um, is, is we basically have a similar system of mitigation, disaster response, and relief. Uh, there, uh, under these, we have these organizations that work all across the, all across the country to basically implement our policy. And I wanted to mention under the National Disaster Management uh, Commission, there's actually an annual plan that is made every year, which. Uh, basically gives a survey of any weak areas where disasters are possible. And it proposes uh, emergency uh, systems uh, and, and commissions which are established in disaster zones for uh, carrying out the disaster work. Uh, and uh, the, the ministries that are involved all um, include the, the armed forces, the people, the UN agencies and nonprofits, including Charity Doings Foundation. And uh, just to give a backdrop, this presentation is actually going to be mostly about floods. So uh, I took out some some data from the, the, the plan that was issued this year. And uh, based on the survey, we found that there, there were around eight floods in, in the last 11 years, which is like becoming a major phenomenon. And we also had the highest amount of losses in floods as well, which was around 40 million. Uh, just in the last 11 years. And this number is only human-centric because um, unfortunately the National Disaster Management Act has no mention of animal welfare. Uh, I'm sure Altamish will pop back in again. So while we are waiting for his reconnection, does anyone have any questions? And Altamish, I want to mention, if you double click on your presentation, it should go into full screen mode. Now. Perfect, thank you. 
Yeah, I'm I'm really sorry. I don't actually know why the internet is just turning off for no reason. Um, so uh, under the flood framework, we have had uh, around eight floods in the last uh, 11 years. The, the population loss has been 40 million. There is no mention of animal welfare in our Natural Disaster Management Act. Um, and uh, these disasters have actually doubled throughout the years, which is why we actually need a plan that includes animal welfare because it's directly linked to the livelihood aspect of uh, of the agriculture industry. And Pakistan actually has a major agriculture industry where 18% of the GDP comes from it. And Pakistan in, in the last year actually exported around 650 megatons of fish. Uh, it, and, and it is actually one the 11th highest producer of uh, milk and, and livestock in the country. So it's a major industry. Uh, but I actually wanted, I would be arguing the reverse when I would be proposing, be proposing a solution. And uh, in, in the last uh, that happened, I actually had a uh, loss of 33 million, 33 million people were affected. Uh, and under, under more like, in-depth scrutiny, we saw that livestock numbers in, in, in last year's floods were, losses were around 1.16 million. Um, and I actually wanted to clarify that since Pakistan does not have animal welfare in the Natural Disaster Management Act, livestock protections are actually purely for livelihood reasons. And uh, at the same time, there were 1,700 deaths and billion dollars of losses. And uh, we had a poor pre-disaster service system in, because uh, the number of medical facilities that are available in Pakistan were mostly destroyed. Even for the human part, we only had around 18,000 facilities across across the country, of which um, around five to 6,000 were, were not functional when the disaster happened. And uh, these are the human numbers from the disaster loss from last year. Uh, when we did the the animal rescue last um, in in the floods that happened last year. Uh, we learned a few key lessons that I wanted to share. One of them is uh, Pakistan, since uh, it's a it's a weak country, it's an economically deficient country. It does not have animal welfare anywhere, and doesn't have animal welfare in the National Disaster Management Act. Anthropocentrism was the the main thing that we we faced and and to tackle it and this is something that charity drinks foundation has been doing um for the last 10 years actually is the is doing projects that involve human and animal welfare because um we often hear these questions like why are you working on animal welfare when humans are suffering um so to avoid that question it's it's much better if you're working in at least in poor countries like pakistan you should actually propose a solution that helps both humans and animals. So what we did in, in the flood zones particularly was uh, we basically were able to hire some emergency veterinarians. They went in with us in the flood zones and they provided the vaccinations and we were actually able to buy through, through funding actually from Humane Society International uh, food for these animals around 120,000 kilograms of food. Uh, the main lessons that we learned was um, Firstly, Pakistan has very weak surveillance systems and uh, majority of the Pakistan's uh, economy, actually in the agriculture sector, 70% of it is rural based. So all these people have their animals with them and only 30% industrialized. So these 70% people actually never received uh, the, the warning at the right appropriate time. So they were never able, were able to leave and the on animals were all there. So transportation was actually the first issue that we faced. And uh, the second issue that we saw was, uh, that we actually used was basically tackle anthropocentrism, where we in, that did human welfare work alongside animal welfare. And under this, when we set up this camp right, uh, right around it, we actually were able to uh, set up a uh, facilities to basically provide for humans in, in the same place. We were actually setting up disasters on schools uh, in, in areas so we could tell these people how human welfare and animal welfare is connected. And the other thing that we did uh, in, in, this, in these disasters uh, was actually work with the people and we actually took them in with us. They uh, And Pakistan also actually has 
uh, an education literacy rate of only 50%. So people didn't know about the connection between animal and human welfare. So we had to sit with them actually and uh, educate, educate them on this issue that uh, their livelihood was pretty dependent on the health of their animals. So we were able to provide them free of cost vaccination material. And uh, uh, unfortunately, Pakistan has a flood again coming in this year, but not of the same scale. So uh, we are working again with these people to provide them uh, the educational facilities so they could, uh, in, in actually trying to develop a pre-disaster surveillance system so they could uh, have these resources already available where they can uh, take care of their animals and uh, that's actually what we did in the flood zone. The main issue was for, for us was transportation. There was no temporary shelters available in anywhere in, in the country where we work, particularly in Sindh and Balochistan, where the floods had the most amount of, uh, of damage. And that is something that uh, Pakistan actually needs to change. It needs to develop these emergency centers where uh, educational, sorry, health facilities are available for both humans and animals. Uh, we need a, a, a stronger surveillance system where uh, these people are informed before time that they can actually move away with their animals. And we need to provide them with, with financial resources so they can access the things. And we also need to make sure that there are educational facilities available where these people can learn about why animal welfare is important. Uh, and another issue that uh, Charity Doings Foundation works in Pakistan is the drought issue. So Pakistan has yearly droughts in, in the southern part of the province. So what we do is we actually install water projects all over the country, which provide water both to humans and animals. And uh, we started our, we did our first water project in, in Pakistan around in 2020. Now we have 1,000 plus water projects. So over like at least a million animals every year alongside human beings come at these water projects and benefit from them. Because uh, if these were non-existent, there has been a reported loss of life of around uh, at least uh, 10 to 20,000 animals every, every year. And uh, the government kind of doesn't have any kind of a response. Uh, and we are actually working with these people, educating them about animal awareness, uh, but there's still a lot more to be done. And uh, we, alongside the animal welfare part, we actually uh, do human welfare work. This, this is actually a picture from, uh, from a site that we worked in last year. There were devastating effects and humans were suffering equally alongside animals. And so this is actually one of the major reasons why our project was a success and we were able to rescue over 8,000 farm animals. And it was because we were working with humans and in a country like Pakistan, where the legal framework and the religious framework is um, is actually, you know, towards pro animal welfare, but it has not been utilized properly. Uh, we were able to basically cut down the anthropocentrism part and were able to not only just help animals and humans. This is actually something that um, I would actually recommend on, on a worldwide scale as well. So uh, just in natural disaster response work, we were able to provide over 120,000 uh, kilogram of animal food last year through our water projects, 1,000 plus. We are able to basically connect human and animal welfare and especially uh, reduce the loss of animal life in, in drought, which, which happen every year in, in, in our country. And uh, from, from the legal end, actually what I'm uh, trying to propose is that for if, even though it is not possible at this point that animal welfare would become something like a major part of the Natural Disaster Management Act, uh, we actually can use the argument of livelihood protection for uh, introducing clauses where food, water, and at least vaccinations are available for these animals. And these were actually one of the major hurdles that we faced. And uh, the other thing I actually wanted to mention was under the Sendai framework, even though Pakistan is a party and uh, the framework only protects livelihood of animals as, and as, as assets because that there's human loss there. But I actually wanted to propose something uh, which is completely the reverse of it is actually industrial agriculture 
uh, should be actually banned or we should move away from it because it is one of the major precursors of natural disasters. And Pakistan, even though doesn't have a major industrial agriculture facility, it, it happens across the world. And we actually need to work on more of a prevention side of a framework where we are advocating for disasters to never happen in the first place because whenever they, they do happen, it's almost always too late. And that is actually uh, something that I personally saw in my work in Pakistan, and uh, what in, in, in and that's something that that I personally believe is also lacking in the Sandler framework is that it it only focuses on farm animal frameworks, and all of the other animals are not protected under it. And uh, we actually and and the framework itself doesn't talk about prevention. It actually talks about mitigation, but not prevention. And uh, what I actually would like to propose is that we need to move away with industrial agriculture because it is one of the major precursors of natural disasters. And under the same framework, uh, this is something that I'm working on is animals actually have different needs in natural disasters and different animals have different needs. So we actually need to, uh, to create an animal protection matrix that is specific for every animal. And uh, even the farm animals can be protected in the Sendai framework without basically removing industrial agriculture from the framework, we will only be causing more disasters. And when the disasters has happened, it's, it's already too late. Uh, for wildlife, I actually wanted to suggest a case study under the rights of nature framework that's available in Latin America and under the religious framework that is also available in Pakistan because uh, there are provisions in, our, in, in the text of the Quran, which is religion in our country, and 97% of our population is Muslim. Our legal system is also Islamic-based, and uh, so we actually used it to, to basically make a case for more human protections. And on the right of na nature, uh, Latin America can actually make a better case for these kind of protections. Uh, we all know that companion animals are, are basically the main kind of animals that are protected across the world. So uh, that is something that I did not touch about. But another thing that I saw in my research was um, under the international framework is that we actually need to work on disasters that happen underwater. And there was a case study in New Zealand where the live animal exports were banned because of Altamish will be back in just a second when his connection comes back. Has anyone thought of any questions yet to ask him when he returns? What an amazing undertaking he has going on. Um, can you see the, the presentation? We can, welcome back. Yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, so under the legal protection matrix, which has to be animal surface specific, uh, there was a, uh, a live animal export ban in New Zealand under the two pretexts that uh, firstly it is, it is armed for the animals, but we actually causing lots of underwater disasters. Those should be avoided. And uh, when these animals, like they undergo transport many times, the ships basically, um, can can go down and that affects all the marine wildlife effect and um and we actually need to focus on using the angle of antimicrobial resistance which is happening across the world and pakistan actually needs to use it as well and uh, to basically under the covid framework uh to make this case even though we don't have a lot of marine animals um uh, because we we don't have any uh, kind of like a bigger industry and the, the last thing I actually wanted to propose under the framework was we actually should produce protections for liminal animals as well, which is the best, because currently uh, we do use anticoagulant rodenticides, which uh, can increase the risk of antimicrobial resistance in these animals, which can lead to another zoonotic pandemic. And uh, if these things, if, if this happens in Pakistan, uh, there is basically no possibility for the country to, to survive. Um, and these were actually some of the, the things that I found were would be helpful. Uh, but the big, big uh, and, and the lesson that I also learned from my research that we actually need to get some plan A available where uh, countries can actually see how much animal loss has happened in Pakistan doesn't have any. Uh, so that's something I really wanted to start with. And I wanted to propose was uh, a prevention framework rather than uh, in a disaster framework, 
because when when the disasters happen, it is as is actually already too late, and we actually need to focus on the connection of human and animal welfare work at the same time. Because in countries where there is no animal movement, like Pakistan, working only on animal welfare in natural disasters is not going to be getting that much traction, and you will not be able to reach those people out. So this is actually why our, our work kind of worked. And uh, this is something that I would propose in other, especially poor countries where veganism or animal welfare does not exist. And uh, that is actually where I will close my presentation. Thank you. Wonderful, Altamish. Thank you so much. We do have a couple of questions. The first one is, why do you consider commercial agriculture a problem? Actually, that's uh, fairly simple because uh, there is research available that industrial agriculture and uh, because it, it actually causes more disasters like uh, by the release of sulfur, methane uh, into the water system. There's a, a mini disaster that happens with the life, especially fish, and it can basically lead to more antimicrobial resistance and which is actually linked to the COVID disaster that happened. And Pakistan is actually trying to build kind of a framework to tackle that, but it is not going to be touching industrial agriculture in any way. And uh, I mean, the basic idea is that prevention frameworks are always going to do better than doing work in the disaster because when it actually happens, it's almost always too late. Thank you for that. We do have one other question, um, Dr. Jackson Z from Four Paws International asks, has there been some consideration for the protection of pollinators in disasters? Pollinators, actually, uh, no, I, I would say that there has been no work on that area. In, in Pakistan. Okay. Another question, have you, or did you ever coordinate your actions with humanitarian international organizations? Uh, Pakistan actually doesn't have any, oh, humanitarian organizations. Uh, we collaborated with another nonprofit in Pakistan that does mostly humanitarian work, but they also do animal welfare work. So, uh, but the, the only issue that we were not able to was we actually didn't have enough funding. And uh, when the disaster happened, uh, since we actually have a small team, we are like only 30 people. Uh, we actually had to just go into the flood zones and keep working uh, for straight for three to four months and rescue not only animals, but humans at the same time on our own. Okay. Do we have any additional questions for Altamush? Hearing none, thank you so much for your presentation today. We are just about four minutes. Oh, I apologize. We do have one more question. What kind of training has your team taken? Uh, that's a very good question. And uh, we, and by, so we actually, our training, like we don't have like a training framework, like a, like a course, because most of the, the work in Pakistan that we do was based on learning from previous disaster work. Uh, but we have developed some kind of things that are, that are, that we now pass on to the people who work with us in, in, a, in the flood zones, which is we basically, uh, try to educate people on how to talk with other people because that's the, the the initial main barrier because Pakistan only has a literacy rate of 50 50 percent so to make a connection between human and animal for con concerns is 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 really hard so uh, that's that's almost always why we you know kind of focus on both human and animal welfare work at the same time because uh, then we don't I mean, because we get this question every day, why are you working on animals when humans are suffering? So we kind of always try to avoid that question because um, it, it's it's actually not helpful to, to any any party. Uh, so uh, that's the first thing that we teach them in our training program, that you have to understand that human welfare has to come alongside human animal welfare because 
animal welfare systems kind of do not exist in my country. Uh, then we um, provide them, like, for example, it is, if it is veterinarians, uh, Pakistan, I mean, doesn't have like a disease surveillance system which protects animals. So there are not a, many protection, sorry, educational trainings available to veterinarians themselves. So, and, and we actually don't have that kind of expertise, but we go into the flood zones and uh, we actually uh, help them set up their medical camps and take in animals and actually learn on the spot most, most of the time, because the first time we did the natural disaster work last year was, was, was the first time we ever did it. And, they, and, and I can actually, um, I only know of one other nonprofit in Pakistan that does farm and rescue natural disasters. So it's it's a developing system, but we do want to create more trainings uh, in the future, actually this year. Wonderful. And has the training that your team has taken or the training you're offering, is that on par with the standards of training that national disaster responders must take? Uh, In other words, are you, are you training to a set of standards either um, from Pakistan or from another country? I mean, from, for, just for animal welfare protection in, in these areas, we are trying to set up some kind of trainings that we can give we are because um, as we went through the flood zone the first time the only things we knew was basic veterinary care and we basically employed our vets to do that and the other thing was how to give at or administer food to them so we are going to develop one and pakistan doesn't have those kinds of things right now so we are trying to develop it. So it, it's it's not part of the international standards as of this movement, because there's nobody actually doing this work in Pakistan. So we're just kind of perhaps the first or second one. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. So Ultimush, we will thank you and say good night, good day. <laughs> thank you for being here and presenting with us.